Good evening. Hi, I'm Susan Gindy. I'm Director of Student and Academic Services at the Ford School, and I'm very pleased you've joined us for this uh, webinar this evening. Today has obviously been a very difficult day in our nation's history. So we, before we begin this webinar, Dean Barr would like to make a few remarks about what happened today. Dean Barr. Thanks, Susan, and welcome everyone this evening. I'm, I'm sure um, some of you are watching um, and participating tonight with maybe a split screen and half of your screen with eyes on uh, the Capitol and what's happening there this evening. It's been an extraordinary um, day, obviously, in our country's history. Uh, on the one hand, we had a really an amazing an event uh, yesterday and into early this morning with voting in Georgia uh, with a quite unusual circumstance of a special election for two Senate seats with the Senate uh, partisan balance um, uh, hanging on the outcome of that decision. And uh, in many ways, a historic vote, a significant uh, turnout uh, for a special election. The election of the first African-American Democrat uh, in the Confederacy since uh, Reconstruction, uh, the first uh, Jewish member of the Senate from Georgia, um, and uh, an extraordinary display overall of our country's ability to use the electoral process uh, in effective ways. We had uh, Republican administrators in Georgia, uh, the Secretary of State and local uh, election officials uh, emphasizing the way in which the vote occurred um, as being a normal part of the democratic process. And that was an extraordinary thing to watch. It, it reaffirms our faith in democracy. And at the same time this afternoon, we saw uh, really an extraordinary unprecedented attack on the United States Capitol uh, by anti-democratic uh, rioters who broke into the Capitol, who smashed um, uh, facilities, who injured um, police officers, and who forced uh, the House and the Senate of the United States uh, to leave session in the midst of counting the electoral votes uh, for the next president of the United States. Uh, just an extraordinary assault on our democracy. And as I said earlier this evening in a very brief statement, I really condemn in the harshest terms uh, the attack on the Capitol and also the voices of political leaders who incited and encouraged that attack. And I think we are a country that has a very strong democracy, but it is a democracy under attack and it requires all of us uh, to do our part uh, to stand up for it uh, in times of peril. So that's really what I wanted to say by way of opening. I know that's not a light opening or a lighthearted opening, uh, but it is one that is I think true to the moment we're in right now. And with that, let me turn it back over to Susan to get us started. Thank you, Dean Barr. Um, it's also a, a pretty stark reminder of why um, we can be proud of the Ford School's mission uh, as community dedicated to the public good. Um, and I hope that um, many of you on this call um, will join us in this mission as well. Um, so the format of this webinar will be a, a Q&A question and answer session in which I'm going to pose some questions to the Dean. Several of you have already sub submitted some questions. Thank you for doing that. Uh, if we have time towards the end, I'll invite you to submit some other questions uh, in the chat room and we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, this is the last in our webinar series. Um, but I want to encourage you to check out our events website as we have some incredible policy talks with distinguished speakers uh, that will help you get a real sense of what the Ford School is like and its intellectual vibrancy. So with that, I will pose the first question to Dean Barr. Um, can you tell us what are your priorities for the Ford School in the next couple of years, um, apart from navigating this uh, public health crisis we've all been in? 
Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, maybe before I get started, let me ask those of you who feel comfortable, if you wouldn't mind turning on your videos, then we can all see each other and, and connect. It's a little bit more of an intimate community. Um, I understand that not all of you feel comfortable in the circumstances you're in to do that. Um, but if you do feel comfortable, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Um, I'm really excited, Susan, about the next couple of years at the Ford School. Um, as you said, um, part of what we've been doing is, is navigating the pandemic. Uh, but even in the midst of that, um, this whole year, uh, we've been very much focused on continuing the amazing progress and continue to build the um, community um, that is the Ford School. Uh, we've managed to have a, a very a tight knit, um, close community, even in the midst of this global pandemic and even while um, all of us are connecting over Zoom and other um, kinds of uh, electronic means. Um, and so I look forward very much to having a, that tight knit community back and hopefully back um, soon in person and, and in our wonderful Wild Hall. Um, I'm also really looking forward in the next couple of years to continuing to build our leadership initiative. Uh, we um, did a soft launch of that earlier this year. We piloted um, the leadership initiative in lots of different ways. And now I think we're ready to um, really bring it to the whole Ford School community. Uh, and that's really exciting for me. So the leadership initiative involves um, everything from uh, in our internship experiences, um, students uh, will be offered the opportunity to do individualized and group leadership coaching uh, in, um, in their internships is a wonderful way to build um, career uh, resiliency and to learn about oneself and, and make sure one's taking advantage of, of these opportunities. Uh, we have leadership assessments built into the curriculum, um, really starting with the summer before uh, you arrive on campus. Um, that lets you get a sense of um, your own strengths and how to build on those strengths during your Ford School career. We have uh, leadership uh, being built into many of our courses, um, including uh, really importantly, work on conversations across difference. How is a leader uh, to engage in and work with people who are uh, quite different from you, um, which I think is so critical at this time for our country's um, history. So I'm really excited about the leadership initiative. I'm excited to continue to build on our strengths in social policy. We've been um, so deeply engaged uh, in the communities that we serve. Uh, and we've been able to do that uh, even in the midst of this global pandemic. And that to me is really exciting. I think it, we have an unusual combination at the Ford School that I haven't seen in the same way of both a deep um, and uh, really uh, impressive uh, bench of academic rigor uh, working at the highest levels and also a deep and abiding partnership, a genuine mutual learning uh, with the communities that we work with um, in Michigan and around the country and really around the world. And I think that combination is pretty special. It's something that I look forward to um, uh, deepening and continuing to support with our program in practical policy engagement, with the work that we're doing at Poverty Solutions, uh, with the work I do in the Center on Finance, Law and Policy, engaging in how to make the financial system work better uh, for uh, small businesses and for people. Uh, so that's a second big thing I'm really excited about. Um, a third thing I'm really excited about is the continued growth of our international work. Uh, we launched um, last fall the Wiser Diplomacy Center uh, with really an all-star cast of speakers, um, Hillary Clinton, uh, Condoleezza Rice, Steve Hadley, Susan Rice, Samantha Power, uh, Steve Began, I could go on, Dennis, Dennis McDonough. Um, and even more importantly, uh, in our international work, opportunities for students to um, get supported and uh, be able to engage in self-initiated projects um, all over the world. And that's been an amazing thing to see and to, to grow. So anyway, Susan, I don't wanna go on too long, but those are three examples of some of the things I'm excited about uh, for, the coming, for the coming year. Thank you. So given your background, uh, uh, when you worked at the US Department of the Treasury as Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions, 
Um, one of the questions we received is, what do you think about the regulatory role of government on monitoring fintech companies, especially in the developing country, world where it is capturing huge market share? I think that the developments in fintech are really exciting. Um, there's some really phenomenal new ideas and new products, new services that are being tested uh, around the world. Um, and in many ways, um, uh, some countries have leapfrogged the United States in technology, um, in payment systems, for example, and the ability to, to get your money when you want it and pay your money when you, when you need it. Um, uh, many countries have leapfrogged us. Um, and, and so that fintech innovation is really, really exciting. It, it does require a really good and strong and careful enabling environment. And sometimes what can happen is that uh, the regulatory system can get kind of ossified and lock in the power of the kind of the old guard, the dinosaurs, the incumbents. Um, and that's really bad um, for innovation. And at the same time, there's a real risk that regulators don't pay enough attention to the risks in fintech, uh, the risk to consumers from being taken advantage of, the risk to investors from being misled or abused, or the risk to the financial system for not being careful enough about um, having uh, equivalent requirements across the financial sector so there isn't a race to the bottom in standards. Uh, and so I think a lot of what uh, I'm interested in, in in the financial sector is getting that balance right, uh, fostering innovation, but making sure there are guardrails in the system uh, so that uh, people don't get taken advantage of and, and aren't put at um, inordinate risk. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so how has the curriculum and the culture changed at the Ford School following this year that we've had with the global pandemic? the racial tensions and the election. Um, related to that, mm -hmm. how has the graduate program adapted to the risks posed by the coronavirus while preserving the educational opportunities and rigor that students expect from the Ford School? So sort of two questions, but similar. Yeah, I think it's maybe eight questions. <laughs> Sorry. In the form of a two-part uh, two question, but uh, a super question and a really important question. Um, let me start by saying I've been really proud of how the Ford School community has navigated this crisis. Um, it was tough. Uh, we all went online in March um, uh, of last year. Uh, we uh, moved quickly to, to, um, to get people uh, the learning that they needed. And then we spent the summer, the faculty, um, deeply engaged in uh, working on how to teach and learn effectively on remote and hybrid platforms. Uh, and that work, I think, really paid off. There was a task force we put together that brought together our faculty and students to focus on this. And I think that the experience um, last fall, uh, teaching largely remotely, uh, was much more positive than most people feared. Um, and uh, there was genuine uh, engagement in the student body. Many students helped faculty navigate the technology. Um, some of them needed more help than others. Um, we, um, we also spent a lot of energy focused on our community um, and trying to stay creative and engaged in building our community because we wanted to be sure that, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of what happens uh, at Weill Hall at the Ford School is informal. It's the connections and sparks you create with your fellow students and with your faculty members and with staff. And so we paid a lot of attention to making sure that could continue even in the environment of this year, which was uh, really, really uh, very difficult. And I, again, I think people stayed tight knit and stayed focused um, and stayed connected. And that was also true with respect to the issues of racial justice that were brought to the fore last summer. Uh, we spent a lot of time together, the faculty, the students, um, staff, uh, trying to describe the kind of community we wanted to have together and the values that we stood for. Uh, and we worked together on those problems. Um, and I, I think it's made us a very strong community. It's a community that um, is based on trust uh, and uh, based on action. And I, I think that, um, again, I, I couldn't have been um, happier to be part of the community that we are 
in uh, thinking about how to address issues of racial justice um, over the last, well, really the last four years but, uh, that I've been dean, but, but certainly um, with uh, a lot of energy um, and discussion last summer. Um, I'm hopeful that um, some of the lessons that we learned will uh, carry forward as we, I hope, um, get into a more normal environment next fall. Um, and if the vaccine process uh, works as people suggest and, and people are good about taking the vaccine, uh, then it seems likely that by next fall, we'll be in a, a much better place than we are um, today. Uh, by we, I mean the country. Um, uh, the Ford School is in the same place that, um, uh, that the rest of the country is in. So I think that um, our emphasis on community, our emphasis on our, on our living our values, our emphasis on staying focused on transparency and clear communication, our ability to focus on things outside of ourselves, to really understand that we're a community dedicated to the public good, that served us uh, in great um, uh, uh, stead in this uh, crisis. And I think um, it's because it authentically represents who we are and we're able to carry that forward into, I hope, a, a better time in the, in the coming years. Yeah, I have to say one of my favorite events um, was we had a, a online holiday party and I will confess I was pretty skeptical of what that would look and feel like, because usually our holiday party is just raucous and fun and outrageous. Um, but it was incredibly- There's some nice outrageous moments in this. Day. It has some outrageous <laughs> moments, it definitely did. Um, but the creativity and, um, you know, it was, it was, it was great. So uh, yes, so we are still uh, finding ways uh, to connect as a community. Um, so, um, related to the to the question I just asked you, um, what lasting impacts has on learn ha online learning rather had on the Ford School? Do you think that there will be um, continuing lasting impacts uh, when we are able to return to a you know more normal environment? I think that um, we learned a couple things. One is that um, there are interesting aspects of what we do. The, um, online that could carry forward even if we, you know, revert to, to usual in-person classes. One of the things, for example, that we did with our policy talk series is we had these amazing speakers who came all during the middle of the pandemic. By came, I mean, you know, appeared appeared in our in our Zoom rooms, um, and we were able to have really good conversations with them and to replicate a lot of the in cl close in-person interaction we had with our outside speakers for our students. And at the same time, in addition to that more intimate setting with our students, we were able to reach thousands of, um, of people around the world. Uh, so, you know, our event on, just pick a cut, we had an event on US-China relations at the beginning of, um, of the fall term and we reached over 10,000 people all over the world. We, um, I did an event with a few students where we, um, we interviewed Trevor Noah um, from The Daily Show. And that was fabulous. And we could do it because he's sitting in his apartment and we're sitting in you know, wherever we were and, and most of us in Ann Arbor. And um, we reached you know, 14,000 people around the world um, with students getting to talk to Trevor Noah about the importance of um, voting and voting rights. So we've had these, I think, nice creative moments that allow us to combine the intimacy of our community and the close-knit nature of our community with reaching a broader audience. I think that is something that um, uh, will definitely uh, carry with us as, as just one example. So with so much populism and small government increased popularity across the world, where do the private and public sectors hold responsibility? for alleviating social inequities? Well, that's a very big question. Um, I think that uh, there's actually a role to play for all different kinds of sectors of society. Uh, there's a role for the private sector, the uh, private for-profit sector. There's a role for the nonprofit sector. There's a role for state and local government and for the federal government, a role for international organizations and for foreign governments. 
And I think one of the things that we do well at the Ford School is train, uh, help to train our students for all the different kinds of roles they can play in society to advance the public good. The basic toolkit that you learn at the Ford School, the analytical toolkit, the smarts, the knowledge base, the communication skills and writing skills. We have a, a killer writing program. I'm sure Susan has described you before, but it's one I'm really proud of. Um, those kinds of essential skills and the leadership skills that I described earlier are uh, applicable across lots of different sectors and in lots of different ways. And so I think our students can find lots of paths to contribute to the public good. And my own view is uh, all of those are really critical if we're gonna tackle the enormous challenges we face as a society. Uh, you know, we need uh, the next generation of, um, of students, of young people to lead on issues of climate change to lead on issues of racial justice, to work on criminal justice reform, to uh, overcome poverty in the United States and around the world, to help bring our country together and not have the kind of divisiveness that is ripping our society apart right now. These are all skills that can be learned and taught and developed and then applied to help solve our world's really most pressing challenges. And, and so I guess a, a long way of answering your question is I, I think that um, each of these kinds of components in our society have really strong and important roles to, to play in, in solving these problems. Speaking of the skills that we're able to provide, why do you think the Ford School is so strong in the field of policy analysis compared with other MP MPP programs in the US? Um, that's historically been a, a, a very core strength of our school, um, public policy analysis. Um, when you go back and look, the Ford School has been around in, in, in various incarnations um, since 1914, uh, since, so the, since the progressive era. So it, it's a very old and established school in that sense. In the 1960s, uh, there was a decision made here at Michigan and in a couple other places to really focus on quantitative analytic skills, empirical economics, systems research, to help solve uh, fundamental challenges in society. And that tradition carried forward. Um, and so it's really deeply rooted in our DNA. We have a lot of faculty who are the leaders in their field um, in quantitative um, uh, perspectives, analytic perspectives on public policy. Uh, so it's, it's a core tradition. It's, I think it's why we so consistently um, uh, ranked uh, number one in public policy analysis um, in the country. Uh, and I think what we've been able to do is to build on that core analytic strength with strength in the other areas that are really essential um, for uh, being effective. So public policy management and leadership, uh, I mentioned effective communications uh, and writing skills, uh, being able to work across difference and, and build on diversity, uh, understanding the values um, of institutions, their history, their origins, uh, how to move them, how to organize them, how to make them effective, uh, how to be a change agent, um, in an organization and how to bring change more broadly. Uh, so that basket of skills, I think, builds on the core um, strength. Uh, you know, I'll say, you know, one of the things, um, when I was in government, we used to have this expression, like, what's your, what's the ratio of your views to your knowledge <laughs> or to your understanding? And if you had a really whacked out percentage where your views really outstripped your knowledge and understanding, people kind of got tired of listening to you. You didn't really have something that worthwhile to say. But if you could build on a really strong base of fundamental analytic skill, then things start to get interesting and then you can really get stuff done. Wonderful. 
Um, I've got one or two more questions. So if uh, others on this call would like to submit some questions in the chat box, um, we'd be happy to try and entertain those. Um, so go ahead. Well, we're, I think we're a small enough group, Susan. If people want, I'm happy to have them shout them at me. So okay, I'm easy. Either way, whatever you're comfortable with, you guys can submit them via the chat line or just raise your hands. Um, but a couple of practical related questions we got, one of which I'll ask you, Michael, one of which I think I'll probably uh, handle. Um, the first for you, what advice do you have for prospective students who may be transitioning back to school uh, after working for a few years? Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is you can do it. I know some of our students come back in to school after being out for a while and they're, you know, they're a little scared uh, and that's okay. Um, that's actually maybe a healthy sign of humility um, that should be admired and respected. Uh, but the first thing I'd say is you can do it. Um, if you're admitted to the Ford School, you are wicked smart and you are um, a hard worker. Um, and I should also say, you're extremely unlikely to be a jerk. Uh, and that combination, I think, will go far for you. And you'll be great um, uh, coming into that new, that new environment. I guess the second thing I would say is um, be really open to the opportunities that are presented to you. Um, some people come into the school knowing they want to work with Brian Jacob on education policy and higher ed, and that's why they've come to the Ford School, and that's terrific. Um, but you should also be open to finding other avenues and other strategies that you want to pursue uh, and be open to those opportunities. The third thing I'd say is um, really get to know your professors. Um, one of the things that I think is extraordinary about the Ford School is we have these, I think, uh, amazing faculty, um, brilliant faculty, but they're really here. Um, they're really part of the community. They're open. Um, they want to mentor you. They want to meet you. They want to talk with you. Um, they really love our students. The reason they're here in the Ford School is they want to be doing the work they're doing in the community we have, which is a, a small, tight-knit community where we can really get to know each other. Uh, you can really have access to faculty. So when they invite you to come to office hours or um, uh, to connect with them, uh, you should take them up on it. Don't be nervous about showing up. Just show up and, and chat. I have office hours regularly myself um, for students who want to connect. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is um, really get to know your fellow students um, and our wonderful staff. Um, it's really a, a, a terrific group of people. You'll learn a lot from each other. Um, and uh, I think that um, one of the cool things about our community is that um, there aren't these like very high barriers between faculty and staff and students. It's really a quite open and flexible um, and a good way to get to know each other, um, uh, to learn from each other and to do good things together. Um, our students, I'm always amazed um, about what our students are doing. I usually, sometimes I find out in advance and often I'll find out long after the amazing work that our students are doing with each other to make our own community stronger, the Ford School community stronger and to, to make the communities around us stronger. So uh, get to know each other. Wonderful. Um, the last question I'll ask, as I mentioned, um, I'm happy to take it, um, but Michael, feel free to chime in as well, is uh, can you give some insight into how the Ford School works to help first generation students become successful students and professionals? Yeah, I'm happy to say a word or two about that, Susan, and then to turn it over to you. I mean. Um, we have a lot of students who are first-gen students. Um, so um, it's not an unusual thing um, at the Ford School. And uh, we have a lot of faculty uh, who are first-gen students too, who were first-gen students back in their day. And so they, I think, have a good perspective on what the challenges are um, of that. We do have quite a number of um, fellowship 
programs designed to give financial support um, to first gen and other students who are potentially um, facing uh, difficult economic circumstances. I'm sure Susan will talk to you a little bit about, about that. And I think that um, the kinds of hands-on engaged work that we make available um, to students uh, to do research, uh, through internships, through engaged learning opportunities in the semester are particularly well suited to students who may um, be coming to uh, this academic environment from a background that is, has been less exposed to, um, to these kinds of opportunities. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, we sort of take in some ways a two-pronged approach. The first one is we want students to be able to connect with each other, faculty and staff. So very often at the beginning of, um, you know, during orientation, in fact, we'll have a first gen lunch where we will invite new students, returning students, as I said, faculty and staff to get together. And that just starts out by letting everybody sort of breathe a sigh of relief, A, that they're not in it alone. As, as the Dean said, that there are lots of other first gen students um, who have thrived. Um, and so that's, that's the first thing we do, as I said, just to sort of establish that comfort level. But then we also want to provide as much support um, as will help you succeed um, at the Ford School. And um, there are a lot of supports we are able to provide, you know, both academic supports in terms of, um, you know, tutor programs, study groups, um, you know, as the Dean said, you know, faculty are very, very open in their office hours to try to help and support students. Um, graduate career services uh, is really instrumental in helping students um, who may not have, you know, um, you know, this great networking background or, you know, uh, and so how to develop um, those connections to to professionals that will, will help further your, your career. Um, student orgs have been very active um, in really offering that kind of support to first gen students. Um, and so uh, we're a small enough community that we really can be um, honest with each other in terms of what we need, um, what we're getting and what we're not getting. Um, and so we do try to tackle it because um, frankly, it's inspiring. Um, that's, that's not easy to get to the University of Michigan and the Ford School um, as a, a first-gen student. And so we are so proud. We want to do everything we can uh, to help you succeed. So those are the questions that um, we have uh, gotten in advance. Um, would anybody like to raise their hand and, and ask the Dean uh, or myself or some of our colleagues here on the call, any questions you have? Don't be shy. I'll go have a question. Hi, everyone. My name is Alejandra. I'm calling from California. Let me move forward if I'm also watching the news. Um, has the Ford School done any sort of like implicit bias training or dreamer ally training for their faculty? I had the opportunity to speak with Professor Sanders on her new role and what she has done with inclusion and, and diversity. And you know, I praise her for that, but has the school in itself um, required any type of training for the professors? That way they could get involved with their students and make students of color feel more comfortable? Yeah, we do. We, um, we have uh, regular ways for um, faculty to engage on that, including uh, as a core part of our faculty meetings. Um, so we've had both um, internally having faculty present and discuss issues um, that have arisen in the classroom or strategies that they've tried to deploy. And we've also uh, have outside experts come in and engage with the faculty and uh, provide advice and, and have an opportunity to um, think through these issues. The faculty takes it uh, very seriously. Um, it's an important part of how they think about their jobs. We spent a lot of time, uh, even this summer, as I mentioned, when we were thinking about uh, transitioning to remote work, we understood that 
remote learning has highly differential impacts on our students and frankly on our faculty. Um, and so we spent a lot of time thinking through what that meant and how to make sure that our students and faculty were supported through that process. Again, differentially based on what, what um, their own experiences are. So it is um, you know, quite a critical part of how we think about our jobs. I will also add that we have, um, we've also had some of those bias training, implicit bias trainings for staff, um, both in terms of, you know, offices. I know our own office has, has done that, um, and I know other offices, and it's professional development opportunities um, for staff. So um, that is something that's really um, happened quite a bit at the Ford School. Great, thank you. Both. I, you know, I wouldn't, I won't say that we're perfect on that. I mean, I, that's a, that's a journey, not a destination, um, but it's something we care a lot about getting right. Um, Emily. Hi, thank you. My name is Emily Rounds. I'm a current student at Davidson College in North Carolina, but I'm home in New Jersey now, spent the semester virtual. Um, and so I am really interested in education policy, but I also have really loved my liberal arts education. And I think that without it, I would not be studying what I am. I'm glad that 17 year old Emily didn't pick what I'm studying for the rest of my life when I applied to undergrad. And so what really attracts me to the Ford School is the holistic um, nature of the curriculum, but also being able to do concentrations. And so for you, I guess the question is, um, what do you see as the advantages to that holistic education versus going to a school that ha has a particular like MPP in education or an MPA in education? I'm particularly looking at the MPP for the Ford School. Yeah, I think that's a great point, um, Emily. I, I think that, um, first of all, we wanna give you a set of skills or not give you, but help you develop your own set of skills that, um, can be deployed in lots of different kinds of environments, as I was mentioning before. Um, so, uh, having that having that toolbox, I think, is really um, helpful. While being able to concentrate and learn deep knowledge in an area like education policy, so having that, I think, having that mix is um, is really valuable. And I also um, think that it helps you um, solve problems in more interesting and potentially more impactful ways. Um, if you are struggling with some issue in education policy, for example, and you um, are sitting next to people who are puzzling on a problem in let's say criminal justice reform, well, it turns out there's some interesting issues that overlap those two areas, right? And so you have the opportunity to learn from and listen to and bounce ideas off around people who are trying to solve a problem too in a different domain. And my experience just as a, um, as a policymaker um, in government was that uh, people did much better if they had that combination of you know, real analytic skills and knowledge in some base area plus an openness to learning from people who had very different skills or very, very different knowledge bases. So I, I think that's the, that's the advantage of this kind of program. Awesome, thank you so much. Yep. Eric, you um, have a question? Yes, thank you very much. And thanks um, Dean Barr and others for your time tonight. Uh, my question is uh, sort of building off the question you answered earlier around transitioning back to school for those students who've been out for a while. Um, mine's about people looking to remain in the workforce. Uh, so I'm considering the MPA program, um, you know, been in my current role for six years since I left undergrad um, and looking to stay on in some fashion with my current, with my current um, work um, while pursuing a master's degree. Uh, is there any advice you'd give for students looking to, to do that? Yeah, Eric, what are you, um, what are you doing now? Um, I actually work in, uh, for a policy consulting firm in Lansing. Um, okay. So pretty relevant experience yeah. to, to, yeah. Um, I'd say um, we, have, we have quite a number of students in the MPA program who do that. Um, it is hard 
So I don't want you to, you know, be under any illusion about it. If you're working um, and in school, it's hard. It requires a lot of discipline about time management. Um, but it is, it is possible to do, and many of our MPA students do it. Um, I think that the, the challenge is trying to weave together a structure that lets you stay engaged enough at work, engaged enough in your classes, and still leaves you open to the interactions with faculty and students around you. And so I'd say that third thing is the first two things, you know, students tend to focus on that third thing you have to be as intentional about as the first two. Mm -hmm. So you have to build structure into your life that lets you create space for those kinds of interactions. And that's, I think the hardest part of the challenge. Great. Thank you very much. I'll also just add Eric that, um, the advising support we have, our, my colleagues are, are really good at helping students um, with the logistics of that, helping you decide which classes to take and you know how to sequence them and all that. Um, so it can be very individual, you know, as the Dean said, it's not easy, um, but we can try to help make it um, as individually um, doable for you as possible. You know, our, our MPA program is around a couple dozen students. So it means that what, just to emphasize what Susan said, that, um, you know, we're not like some big factory producing thousands of MPA students. You get, you know, real attention to what your particular circumstances are. And I think that makes a difference in being able to succeed in what is a challenging um, experience. Other questions in the couple. Looks like Emily, minutes. is your hand back up, Emily? Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't think I ever put okay. it back down. So no, you can let someone else go. Uh, thank John? You. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you again for hosting this and everyone's time. Uh, as my handy Zoom name says, my name is John. Uh, I currently work for a university uh, and I have been working a lot on their COVID response teams and implementing policies. I do live events. And so that's been uh, a hell of a thing to do policy for in a pandemic. Uh, I was wondering how you had specifically rolled out your COVID policies and information, how you related to the broader school itself, how much of it was under your control. Uh, you said you'd gone virtual. I was curious as how that information flowed and how you anticipated going forward? John, I, I think you're hitting on a really important question. Um, and I'll say we were really focused as a leadership team on being um, clear and direct and transparent um, about everything we did. Uh, and it started really last, well, our transparency didn't start last March, but the COVID response started last March, I decided for from March until the end of the spring term, I was going to send an email to students and the faculty and staff every single night. Uh, because it was such a disruptive, um, difficult experience for everybody that I wanted to be sure that the community knew that I understood that and I was with them. And so we built into all of our messages and all of our communication information about what we were doing, why we were doing it. But I also very much tried to meet our community where it was. Um, and so what that meant, for example, when you're talking about decision making, I was very open to and did say things like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Let me tell you what we're thinking right now, but it might change because the circumstances might change. Here's how we're thinking about the problem. Here are the values we bring to the table. Here are the principles we're gonna to use to make decisions. And I think because of that, the community was able to uh, come along with us as we made really hard choices uh, over the last year. If we can just hang on a couple minutes over, uh, Ruth has a question. 
Hello, Dean Barr. Thank you so much for uh, hosting this session. I really appreciate it. Um, my question has to deal with one of your um, policy concentrations, uh, specifically international policy. Um, having attended a different session, um, I did get the comfort of knowing that you guys do bring in um, guest professors and people who do come in and speak from that from say DC. But I was just wondering about the academic rigor and also the exposure say, is it the same if, of, if equal capacity say with a school around the DC area, essentially. Thank you. Yeah, we have um, terrific access to policymakers um, uh, uh, here at the Ford School. Uh, we're not um, geographically um, constrained um, by being uh, in Ann Arbor on that measure. Um, I think you can see it just kind of by scrolling through the people who we have um, come um, to our campus. Um, and provide real hands-on experience for, um, for our students. And one of the things that the visitors are really good at is you know, providing private time for students, um, having career advice sessions with them, having leadership sessions with them. You know, I ticked off before, you know, Dennis McDonough, Susan Rice, Samantha Power, uh, Condoleezza Rice, Hillary Clinton, Steve Hadley, Steve Began. Um, you know, I could go on and on. And we also have really terrific people who are here full time. Uh, so we have um, a really uh, wonderful faculty member, Susan Page, uh, who we brought on last year, uh, who um, came to us after a, a very long and distinguished career at the State Department, uh, including ser uh, serving as the first United States ambassador to South Sudan. Um, and she lives and works in our community. She's not just coming in for um, uh, for sessions. Um, Mel Levitsky, uh, former ambassador to Brazil and to Bulgaria, a longtime member of our faculty, uh, deeply engaged. Uh, John Chachari, who's uh, really running our International Policy Center and our Wiser Diplomacy Program, uh, who has uh, both a, a fantastic intellectual career and also experience um, uh, at the U.S. Treasury Department, where I used to work. Um, so uh, I could go on and on, but basically um, I think it's a really nice combination of uh, visiting practitioners, uh, in-house practitioners and academics um, who um, uh, provide a, an amazing foundation. And the thing that I love about the University of Michigan is that in addition to the faculty inside the Ford School, you have access to faculty all across the University of Michigan who have phenomenal range of expertise. Um, you know, so let's say you're interested in um, Islamic affairs. You can take not only the courses at the university, uh, at the Ford School that will train you in international policy analytics uh, and basic diplomacy skills and the like, but you could also go long and deep in the Department of Islamic Studies and take as many classes as you could possibly dream of there. And so that, that combination, I think, of in-house expertise and openness and ability to reach across the whole university, um, you know, more than a hundred departments uh, and units and schools that are, you know, top 10 in the world. So it's, I think it's just a, a, a terrific, um, terrific possibility. So we have run out of time. Um, I want to remind you that, it, you know, we've got nine days until uh, the deadline. Um, we are working diligently. So if you have questions or concerns, please, I want to encourage you to just email fspp-admissions uh, at umich.edu. Um, and, uh, you know, we can help you uh, with, the, with the process. Um, and so before we bid adieu, Dean Barr, would you like to make any closing remarks? I just wanted to say it's great to meet all of you. I hope to see you all in the fall. Um, and uh, Susan said, feel free to reach out um, either to the staff or um, to our wonderful students. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And um, I hope to uh, get to have the opportunity to get to know you better in the coming years. And hopefully we will be back in person. So you guys will experience why we call it the food school and not just the Ford school. So I hope you have a safe and pleasant night. Uh, and as always, go blue. Go blue.
Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you. Take care.